everyone. Welcome to part two of our Biocide webinar series. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Megan Marquardt and I'm here with a few members of our AP Tech technical team. Our format today will uh, be just kind of like our last web webinar where we do the presentation and then go into the live question and answer session immediately following the presentation. Um, with the Q&A, I will be taking questions sent to us via the chat, so feel free to type those questions in throughout the presentation, and I'll get to as many as those um, I can at the end. All right, so let's dive right in. Today's presenter is Matt Heikalis. Matt has 20 years experience in water treatment. He served as AP Tech's technical sales director before becoming the VP of sales. He leads AP Tech sales team in offering technical and commercial support while developing and executing strategies to best position the company products and techn technologies in the market. His technical and commercial areas of expertise include boiler, cooling, and closed loop water chemical treatment, along with pre-treatment system design, operations, and troubleshooting. He is a designated CWT and a member of the cooling subcommittee for the Association of Water Technologies. He's a graduate of the University of Illinois with a Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering and holds a Master of Business Administration. Also here today with us, um, with Matt and myself, is Evan Sturm, who is AP Tech's Technical Sales Specialist and AP Tech Senior Technical Consultant, Dave Christofferson. Without further ado, here's Matt. Thanks, Megan. Much appreciated. Uh, this is part two of our Biocide series, how to implement a solid chemistry Biocide program. I think we learned during uh, the first part from Dave um, a little bit about biocides in general, the classifications, oxidizers, not oxidizers, talk a little bit about surfactants, but specifically how AP Tech's got a, a line of solid uh, biocides and surfactants that complement uh, a solid water treatment program. Got a lot of content to go through today, so uh, we'll get started here. So what we really want to talk about uh, during part two is kind of reiterating the factors that impact biocide selection, um, focusing in on what information we need and things that we need to account for. Um, we want to look at options for feed and control uh, and some of the calculations that go along with this uh, that really are around product use rates or, or budget generation and also solution demand. Uh, we want to look at validating feed utilizing remote monitoring. I know a uh, lot of systems and, and programs these days are being connected to the cloud. Uh, gives us a little bit of insight on what's going on when we're not there. And then we definitely want to talk about, you know, considerations around best fit uh, for solid biocides. So, Going back to part one and, and what Dave talked about is, you know, when we're thinking about options and, and how we're going to go about selecting biocides, you know, these things still are very relevant um, and they're dependent on each application, uh, the site, the environment that it's in. So, you know, looking at things that, you know, around sustainability and, and green attitude, there's a lot of different industries, market segments that are certainly uh, continuing to drive towards uh, increased uh, sustainability. They have goals. Uh, usually they're five year goals, 10 year goals by 2030, you know, things like that. Um, certainly water chemistry uh, has an impact pH. You know, what types of microorganisms do we need to, to control? Um, the compatibility with the other components of our uh, multifunctional program, you know, personal preferences um, and kind of biases around biocide selection. Certainly costs have a, have a factor in here. Some, some programs can tolerate and, you know, depending on risk and, and uh, kind of 100% uptime type of considerations. Obviously the materials of construction uh, in these systems and then discharge points and permits have an impact as well. So when we're looking at information we need to, to really build out a biocide program, you know, it's kind of looking at these, you know, what the treatment demand requires. Uh, system volume is very important. So getting getting a handle on that, whether you're walking it down, you're looking at drawings or, you know, install documents to even doing PTSA, you know, type of system volume checks is important. Uh, low down rate, you know, has an impact depending on, you know, your feed methodology and certainly your uh, holding time index is, is part of that along with volume. Uh, which then is retention time uh, calculations. 
the temperature, you know, and how that varies has an impact. The system design itself, uh, not only the design, but the operational uh, component to it as well. And then, you know, any type of demand studies, especially if you're using oxidizing biocides where there is a demand that needs to be met uh, before you can actually obtain some type of residual. We learned about this during part one, uh, but let's talk just briefly about the uh, APTEC solid biocide options available. Uh, we've got Duracor 56, that's sodium dichlor isocyanate. It's a highly active chemistry. It's stabilized chlorine, uh, does well with bacteria, has uh, uh, some abilities to control algae. Uh, it's designed for cooling tower applications, but certainly has some additional uh, uh, applications per the label. Um, Durabrome uh, is APTEX version of, of a BCDMH. Um, so it's a, it's a one bromo three chloral uh, dimethyl hydantoin. So it's uh, delivered through a soaking dissolver. Um, it's going to provide a, a bromine uh, chemistry. Our C100G uh, is a non oxidizing biocide option. It's DVMPA. Again, a very highly active uh, chemistry. Uh, does a, it's a great bacterial side, um, complements well with any oxidizing chemistry. And we did want to uh, reiterate that we do have a number of different uh, dispersants available. Our C pen chemistry uh, is very uh, highly surface active, provides you know good uh, kind of remediation on biofilm, and certainly uh, goes along with these other uh, biocide options. So this would be kind of your starting point of what's available in solid uh, biocide chemistry. And it's just one component. Uh, our next component for delivering a, a solid biocide program would be the dissolver technology uh, that AP Tech deploys. Uh, there's three primary uh, dissolvers that are going to be associated with solid biocides. The Ultra M, uh, we consider our most versatile dissolver. It's a, it's kind of a self-controlling uh, dissolver technology. It's non-electric. Uh, it's a very small footprint. It's designed with chemical resistance in mind. All the components are uh, compatible with the biocides that, that we offer. Um, you can couple these units together to give you increased capacity. Uh, the products you're gonna you're gonna utilize with the Ultra M is the Duraclor 56, the stabilized chlorine our DBMPA and the C100G, and also our CPEN-C surfactant. I did want to kind of highlight that the refill rate on this is a half gallon per minute, so it's uh, it's a very self-sustaining unit, uh, easily uh, fitting within the realm of, uh, of kind of best fit for biocides. Uh, our Ultra G, I think it's a kind of an underutilized dissolving technology. It's a gravity dissolver. It doesn't require a chemical pump. You're essentially using gravity uh, to, to allow solution to be delivered into the system. Any opportunity you have to utilize the Ultra G uh, for biocide addition and certainly for any of the other uh, chemistries like the surfactant and scale and corrosion inhibitor, uh, we feel it's it's a it's a it's a no brainer. It's a it's it's certainly an ideal fit. Uh, it's not always available, but certainly applications where you have processed waters that are below ground. Uh, it's got a high delivery rate of solution and uh, feels a, is a good fit for biocides. It also takes all of our biocides uh, in that unit along with their surfactants. And lastly, we've got the Ultima 500. This dissolver is designed specifically for Durabrome or BCDMH. Uh, Durabrome has a, a lower solubility uh, than the other products. Soaking aids in the ability to get the material into solution. This is unit is designed to do that. It, it provides uh, soaking time. Um, you can load up this unit uh, up to 20 pounds of product, uh, and it's got a high refill rate. Um, the nice thing about it over brominators is that it's you know it's under atmospheric conditions. It's it's still contained. You know, you know products within the reservoir, uh, but you're not concern with you know pressurization that comes along with the brominator. That said, brominators are, are uh, tried and true devices, um, certainly a, another way to deliver BCDMH. Um, we wouldn't recommend brominators with our Durabrome product. 
Uh, but that said, um, at least you have there's options available for uh, delivering this chemistry. And for any of our dissolvers that require pumping, which is the Ultra M and the Ultima 500, uh, we're going to reiterate that you know we recommend a two gallon per hour pump minimum to deliver solution in a in a timely manner. All right, so we've got the products, we've got the dissolvers, so we're working our way through uh, to a point where, you know, what do we need? What tools are available to help us kind of build this this out? Uh, last year, AP Tech um, utilized some of this uh, time during the pandemic to develop a program called Solid Guide. Uh, Solid Guide is a, a mobile app and it's also browser based. Uh, it links and it seamlessly, so any work you're doing on your desktop or on your mobile app, uh, that work saves and is available uh, from either either uh, way of access. But what the features uh, you know included with Solid Guide uh, bring you are is ability to do surveys. Um, you can do product selection. There's a you know full blown product catalog in there. The dissolvers we just talked about are in there with manuals, product bulletins and uh, soon to have some additional new features and there's some useful calculators in there as well so let's talk specifically about you know how that helps us with building out a biocide solid biocide program so we talked about this earlier there's some important pieces of information we need uh, to really put together a successful program system volume a water balance the feed methodology that you want to deploy, uh, the solution strength uh, of that uh, solution we're making down at the point of use, and certainly pump sizing. So what this survey um, form really uh, highlights here on the right is, you know, we're, we're basically building this out as you're inputting the information. At the end, you're going to get, you know, kind of a summary of what you need. So. The operational components are up top, so blow down and, and system volume are, are, are calculated or inputted. And what we're really building down to uh, is a product use rate um, on an annualized basis per month. And from there, uh, we're generating how much solution we need uh, on a daily basis or per injection, and then some pump rec sizing recommendations. So these are, you know, this this tool is designed to to help you get all the way there when it comes to um, product selection, dosing, and pump size. So let's move on to options for feed and control. So we'll start with continuous feed. I think uh, it's. My career, I've, I've kind of erred on the side of, of looking at options or opportunities to look at continuous feed. I, I like the idea of, of, of maintaining some type of either halogen residual or biocide residual in the system at all times. Uh, so that's just uh, kind of a personal preference and experience uh, that I have. Uh, but let's talk about continuous feed. So there's several ways to go about it. You can utilize oxidation reduction potential or ORP as kind of an indirect uh, measurement of, of an oxidizing biocide or a biocide that, that does generate some response to ORP. Certainly in this day and age, tonal and free halogen sensor technologies are becoming more prevalent, especially as you're looking at dis uh, secondary disinfection. And I think the, the technology is continuing to evolve. Uh, so that's another uh, means of looking at continuous feed and monitoring. You can certainly look at hot, you know, outlet, you know, type applications. I know in some of the, the larger applications I had where, you know, you had a continuous kind of blow down, um, plugging in hot was was certainly feasible. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it because you lose control, but certainly is an option. And then proportional to some other type of variable or process, you know, dynamic like flow. So there's no reason you couldn't slave it to something else that provides a, a means of getting product in there on a continuous basis. So what are some of the kind of uh, reasons you go continuous? Certainly on dirtier waters, we have ingress of nutrients, media, microorganisms, um, where they're a constant threat, um, but certainly in clean water systems, there's there's no reason you, you wouldn't or couldn't use continuous feed. 
Uh, higher risk applications, you know, considering healthcare, long term care facilities in that bucket, since there's now ever expanding kind of oversight with water management plans and, and uh, things like ASHRAE 188 that um, that come into play here where continuous feed would be uh, beneficial or desired. And then certainly economics, uh, your preferences, and then kind of the synergistic um, aspects of, you know, use coupling up with DVMPA and surfactants. Intermittent feed, so I think this is more common, uh, especially in, you know, applications like commercial and institutional or like commercial real estate markets, things like that, where you have systems that are kind of cycling on and off uh, during the shoulder seasons um, and even uh, during, you know, some, some uh, other operating periods. But you can look at, you know, most controllers have 28 day programmable timers built into them uh, that are, uh, you know, one to four programs available. Uh, certainly independent timer or control activation um, is another way to, to feed intermittently. You could utilize ORP, um, either uh, creating a wider dead band or even feeding up to an ORP on some time basis. Uh, a percent or recycle timer is also available and there's surely there's a few other methods that I didn't capture here. Commonly applied to systems that are cleaner or smaller in size, I'd, I'd say um, intermittent feed is often used and it's certainly a co lower cost option, um, you know, versus, you know, putting in some type of sensor or halogen specific uh, tech, uh, sensor technology. So let's talk a little bit about uh, feed verification. Um, let's think about some of the things, you know, ORPs, uh, it works, uh, can be effective. It's still a sensor. It still requires maintenance and oversight and confirmation that uh, that it's telling you and giving you good information about what's going on, uh, specifically with a, a, an oxidizing biocide. Um, you do need to still do total and free chlorine testing. Uh, not only during the setup, but also on a routine basis and utilize the RP as again, something that uh, is a response and a pr uh, process variable change to confirm. Um, and then pump size and turn down has an impact as well, whether you're feeding uh, intermittently or semi-continuously. Remote monitoring. So, you know, what I just talked about, and this is what these graphs are kind of demonstrating, the green uh, lines on both graph both in the actual data component and then below um, represents ORP and relay activation. So you can see in an intermittent feed strategy using Duraclor 56 uh, as a result of a relay activation for some uh, period of time, you could see a response in ORP in the bulk water. Uh, to me, that's just a, it's a great way to, to confirm that, you know, I did activate a relay and that something in that system had changed, which would have been, you know, the delivery of an oxidant to there, specifically the dichlor. Um, and then on the bottom one, uh, we're looking kind of more at a semi-continuous feed of BCDMH with more frequent relay activations and a tighter kind of dead band on the ORP to provide continuous halogenation. So continuing down on remote monitoring, some of the key things you can see also are the relay activations and duration, the trending over time, the ability to overlay the data with other process variables. Uh, and also you can set these up to do alarm and limit timers uh, through most controllers that are out there. So take a step back here and look and kind of summarize, you know, some of the things we've just talked about and interject a little bit more uh, into this. So, you know, we've worked our way down to a point where we can select a biocide, select the dissolver technology associated, what tools we're going to use to build out this biocide program and budget and pump sizing. We looked at ways that we can uh, feed and how we can kind of monitor as well and get verification. So for each of uh, the products um, uh, available by AP Tech, so start with the Duraclor, we, we're talking a little bit on this uh, in this table about the feed methodology that can be deployed for each product. So can it be fed continuously or intermittently? 
Um, does it have a response to ORP? So if you're doing feed verification using that type of technology, or uh, I guess you could also consider the halogen specific sensor. Um, where we feel it, you know, the ideal use rate of that product kind of fits, you know, in most cases it's upwards of uh, 0.75 pounds per day of product use um, uh, would be considered ideal fit, but certainly uh, where solid biocides can be deployed at much higher use rates uh, of product uh, depending on the circumstances and the delivery methodology and dissolvers. Uh, when we talk a little bit about the solution strengths that just helps you dial in you know you're if you're doing intermittent feed how long you need to feed for and do the math around that and then the dissolver uh, that we would recommend for each of those uh, products so i'm going to transition into some examples of uh, for each product uh, maybe some scenarios and considerations and, and best fit discussion points so let's uh, let's look at Duracor 56. So we've got an example here where we've got a system that's 7,500 gallons in system volume. We've got a blowdown rate of 2,500 gallons per day, and we've got a chlorine demand of three parts per million. So at Duracor, you know, being a very versatile uh, product, we we certainly can look at continuous feed and intermittent or slug dosing as options. And in doing so and utilizing the tools we have available uh, in solid guide and the survey form, you can see kind of the uh, differences between um, the two types of feed methodology. So um, things to highlight here, which I'll, I'll talk on the next slide about is, you know, we've selected a, a feed of continuous um, and based on three PPM product dosage or chlorine product dosage in this case, after chlorine demands met, uh, we've got a use rate of 22.8 pounds and a solution demand of 0.72. In the case of intermittent feed, because we're slug dosing up to volume, uh, your product use rate will increase uh, because it's a higher uh, volume versus uh, blowdown rate to 68 pounds and a solution demand of 2.28. So I wanted to highlight just some kind of key factors when you're considering, you know, uh, budgets and product or pump sizing. So in this particular example, um, when you're considering continuous versus intermittent, you can see there's a pretty significant change in product use rates depending on your uh, on your decision to, to deploy which feed strategy. Um, but in either case, in that particular scenario, um, both product use rates fit well uh, or fit into the best fit guide as, as ideal fit. Um, there is pump sizing considerations that that's important with that. You know, when you're looking at two gallons uh, of solution per injection versus 0.22 gallons of, uh, of solution demand on the other option, uh, certainly uh, that pump sizing uh, is important to ensure you deliver the, the product in a timely manner. Um, and then the feed methodology also impacts the frequency of inventory replenishment. So if I'm Doing continuous feed, I, I've got a, a, a less frequent product inventory change out than I would on a slug dose basis in that example. So let's continue on with Duraclor 56. So let's just say we want to convert, you know, a, a liquid biocide program, in this particular case, 12.5% sodium hypochlorite or bleach, uh, to Duraclor 56. So We've got to do a little bit of math here, but uh, hopefully I've made this easy in the next slide with a, a chart. But essentially we need to consider the available chlorine uh, for each of these products. Bleach is, starts out at 12.5% and certainly doesn't stay there uh, due to the, uh, the, the nature of, this, the, of that product and, and the conditions it's in. On the Duraclor, we've got a 56% available chlorine product. Um, so as we work kind of through this, um, both pro products have you know, options for continuous and intermittent feed. When we do the conversion of a, of a liquid bleach at 0.15 uh, gallons per day, that equates to about a 0.34 pounds per day of Duraclor uh, equivalency. And from a solution demand standpoint, we're looking at 4.13 gallons per day. So what we did here was provide a chart that shows if you've got a bleach use rate 
in this realm of 0.1 to 2 gallons per day, what that equivalent solution demand would be for the Duracor 56 and the pounds per day of product use. So certainly um, looking at, you know, 0.33, you know, gallons per day of bleach, you know, we're still in that very ideal fit for Duracor 56. But even as you go up in product use rates, it just simply means uh, you just need to consider the pump sizing, uh, perhaps you could add another dissolver for additional capacity. Um, it's uh, certainly very uh, feasible to make a change from bleach to So again, pump sizing plays into this. Um, in either scenario, we've got a two gallon per hour you know pump minimum for the Duraclor when you make the change over. So just make sure you don't sort shortchange yourself on that when you do make a change from liquid bleach to Duraclor. Um, I guess the improvements we want to talk about over bleach is liquid bleach has a you know kind of an off gassing challenge. It commonly requires specialized head you know pump head or off gassing device. That's not needed with Duraclor 56. Uh, product does not off gas um, and does a deliver solution consistently using just a normal pump head. You do lose uh, strength um, of the bleach over time. So if you've got a longer kind of inventory or holding time, you've got a larger base storage tank or you're working out of a drum. Um, as the hours and, and days pass on, that product will uh, reduce in strength, which would require more product per injection. Um, the Duraclor 56 and the Ultra M, uh, we recommend a, a flooded suction uh, arrangement. And in that case, you've got good positive pressure to the pump suction, no need for degassing. Uh, the Duraclor 56, um, also because of the nature of a, being a a weaker solution. There's uh, typically not a localized high pH like you would have a bleach, so you can reduce your quill plugage. That's, I'm sure all of us have experienced at some point in our career when using bleach and uh, stabilizer in the uh, Duracore itself actually can theoretically reduce the overall product usage because your uh, product's not going to be prone to off-gassing or, or losses through recirculation through the tower system. So let's move over to, to Durabrome or BCDMH. So you've got a situation or scenario where bromine chemistry is desired or it's required. There, there are a number of RFPs out there that do call for bromine chemistry. So uh, BCDMH should, uh, should be your solid biocide of choice for that situation. We do want to consider that uh, BCDMH does have low solubilities, hence the design uh, of the Ultima 500 to account for that. Um, it does have a lower ORP response because of the high dantuin stabilizer. So feed verification is possible, but you just got to take that into account when setting up a, a, a program on Durabrome. And you typically generate a higher total chlorine to free chlorine differential. Uh, again, uh, a lot of that's due to the, the high dantuin and the stabilizing effect of it. So when you're setting these programs up, uh, you, you want to test for definitely total and free chlorine for uh, product uh, verification and dosing verification. It is uh, available uh, in several different uh, dissolvers or uh, feeder arrangements. The Ultima 500 is AP Tech's option. Uh, you certainly can use the Ultra G gravity dissolver as well. And certainly if you're looking at BCDMH pellets, Prominator is, is your option there. There are some advantages to kind of slower dissolving rates of the BCDMH when you don't have a lot of demand, um, a product that that you know you can deliver consistently over time. Uh, you're going to have like be less prone to overfeeds or your high free halogen residuals that can you know, help lower you know corrosion rates, especially on yellow metals, uh, and is a good fit for relatively low system volume uh, applications as well. Um, we feel that in makeup waters, um, depending on where you're at, that contain a high level of free chlorine or red ready. If you're utilizing BCDMH, uh, you can get some bromine, bromide oxidation and some, some benefits of, of that. So, you know, consider, consider this product in those types of applications. Uh, it certainly can be used as a supplement to, to chlorine-based programs as well uh, to get that 
chlorine uh, bromide type of uh, activation and, and benefits. The Ultima 500 um, by design, it can deliver about up to 0.8 pounds of product per day if you're looking at a semi-continuous feed. And that you know, equates to about a 32,000 gallon system volume or blowdown rate. Um, so it's a fairly substantial system that this product can be utilized for. Again, we'd recommend a, recommend a two gallon per hour pump for uh, efficiency and getting solution into the system. Uh, if you use an Ultra G, you can deliver higher rates of product to the system and brominators can increase your storage capacity. And we've got a little conversion chart on the right here that just shows on your uh, calculations for you know durabrome demand in pounds per day and what the solution demand will be. Move on to Duracide, the C100G product. This is DBMPA. Uh, let's look at an application where you're looking at two doses per week. You've got 10,000 gallon system volume, a 3,000 gallon per day blowdown rate, uh, and a 2 ppm uh, product dosage. Uh, that's desired. So while we're talking about a slug dosing application, we do feel that DVMPA is highly effective in a continuous feed strategy as well. So we'll take a take a look at that um, in this scenario as well. So doing the math, whether you're feeding continuously or uh, slug dosing twice a week, your product use rate comes out to be the same based on those uh, conditions. Um, what's different is, is in a continuous feed methodology, you're not your solution demand goes down uh, so you only need 1.2 gallons per day uh, in our intermittent uh, feed strategy you're going to need four gallons per dose so again pump sizing um, comes into play and needs to be uh, factored in to effectively dose in both uh, situations um, one note here is that uh, i think uh, people you know look at dbmpa and might Think of it as an oxidizing biocide. It's not an oxidizer, though it does have a halogen component to it. Um, and according to Dow, it does have little impact at normal dosages in the system on ORP. So this is just kind of reiterating that ORP would not be a good feed verification for DBMPA um, in that you know, it will, even if you're on an oxidizing program, you can still utilize the oxidizer and ORP uh, to, to control and, and, and monitor and then overlay with DBMPA, um, whether you're doing it continuously or on a slug doses basis. So let's summarize. Um, we look at the, the biocides that are available. Duraclor 56 is really going to give you a, a, the most versatile option um, and, and in our, our opinion uh, it should be your kind of go to buy a side of choice unless there's other factors that we talked about before that would you know move you away from that and, and here's why I mean you, you've got options on how to feed it um, it works very well on a continuous feed uh, method uh, certainly can be slug dosed. It's a highly soluble uh, material. We generate good solution strengths uh, and you're able to generate uh, good uh, free available halogen. You can use remote monitoring and feed verification with this chemistry. Uh, so that's a, a nice benefit. Um, it works in both clean water and dirty water applications. Um, you don't get that off gassing that you might feed, you know, get with other oxidizers, uh, whether it's bleach or you know, stabilized bromine, things like that. Uh, so there's just reliability around the uh, around the solution delivery um, that, that go along with it. And it's very synergistic with the other biocides and surfactants that are that are there to give you a very robust program. Durabrome, um, we talked about this. It's ideal for clean water systems. You know, you got relatively low chlorine demands and smaller system volumes, uh, but it also uh, is very synergistic with with the other biocides and surfactants as well. So you couple them together, and you, you can have a really good program. Uh, if you need bromine, uh, this is is this is the option, uh, and you have flexible feed options as well, and you can do uh, feed verification as well with with Durabrome. Um, with ORP or halogen. The C100G, um, whether you do it as a complement to the oxidizers 
uh, or as a standalone, uh, it can be very highly effective in a, in a standalone situation, especially in, in cleaner water applications. Um, but you have a relatively low product dosage rate uh, for this product. Uh, it's in the single digit PPM range. Um, it's a very highly effective bactericide. We touched on that during part one. So if you want to review that, you can. Um, and it also offers up flexible feed options in terms of continuous intermittent along with the dissolver technologies available. So this is just a summary. Again, just wanted to reiterate kind of the, the products and the feed methodologies, product use rates and dissolvers. And as we touched on during part one, uh, not only um, do we have these core uh, solid biocides available, we do have a few other products, um, our dispersant or surfactant um, catalogs fairly uh, extensive in terms of the, the molecules and the modes of action and, and what you can do there. Um, we've got a few other products available in a, kind of a slower dissolving with our Envirobrome G. Um, and we also have a calcium hypochlorite available as well. And just to kind of reiterate, not only for the solid biocides that we talked about today, but just solids in general, there's you know a lot of great uh, reasons to, to make the switch. Um, utilize the best fit guides that AP Tech's put together. We have them for cooling water, boiler, and closed loop systems. Those are really help you kind of dial in to where, boy, it's such, you know, if we're operating in these rounds and these things are taken into considerations, you know, there, there are a lot of ideal fits out there uh, for use and in, in, in kind of taking advantage of the, the benefits of going with solid chemistry. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Matt. Um, we did have a lot of questions come in, so I just wanna go ahead and jump right into those if you're good with that. Please. Great, the first question we have is, in the Duraclor 56 slide, you mentioned reducing off-gassing. How is off-gassing reduced? Hey everyone, this is Evan Sturm, uh, technical sales specialist. I figured I could jump in and answer this one. Um, the best part about the Duraclor 56 and the off-gassing, uh, how it's reduced, one is just how we feed our product in general. Uh, as we recommend, when you're setting up a pump with our dissolvers and using our dissolver technology, we specify and recommend that the pumps be set up um, any more gravity flow set up so you're not having any pump suction. Um, so you're not really having to pull chemistry up like you would if you're feeding out of a uh, drum product. Um, and outside of that, the product does have uh, less tendencies of off-gassing when it's used inside of that pump. Um, but as well as any time, you know, when you are using biocides, uh, it is recommended that you are going to be using a degassing head just to ensure that you don't have any outages. But through testing with our product, uh, we've never had any issues with even just using a normal pump. So, um, yeah, we think it's a it's a great product. And, you know, whether you have an off-gassing head or not, uh, just make sure that the, the materials of construction of that pump are compatible with the product. So. OK, thanks, Evan. Um, the next question we have here is, I thought DBNPA was an oxidizing biocide. Can you explain this, please? Uh-oh, uh, this is Dave Christopherson. I got called in on this one. Um, just historically, I think because of the bromo part of it, uh, and if you smell it, sometimes it kind of smells like a halogen or smells like uh, bromine, uh, but it's not. It's a non-oxidizing biocide. It doesn't kill by oxidation. It has different mechanisms for kill. Um, so, and the other thing is that there is a slight um, inflection point on ORP in the 400 range. So it does show some ORP, um, but it's it's strictly not an oxidizing biocide. It's a, it's a non-oxidizer by the way it works. All right, thank you, Dave. Um, and we'll move on to the next question. Let's see who picks this one up. Uh, number three I have here are how reliable are your dissolvers? Evan, again, um, just because I'm kind of the equipment person, I, I enjoy working on the mechanics of things. And this was one thing that we did stress a lot um, during the construction 
of our Ultra M and Ultra G dissolvers, as well as the Ultima 500. Um, the products are made out of uh, typically uh, chemically resistant or biocide uh, resistant, especially on the oxidizing side, uh, materials. So HDPE is uh, heavily used inside of our dissolvers. But as well as just through trial and error, um, as we put our equipment to work, we found through the R&D efforts that there were some weak points. So we did incorporate uh, Hastelloy um, materials, which are very resilient to any type of oxidizing and non-oxidizing biases that would be used inside of our dissolvers. Um, the other part is we got pretty fancy and used some titanium as well, which is a, a pretty neat feature. Um, and again, just another material construction that is resilient to it. Um, and so through at least a handful of years now of submerging some of our, uh, uh, our materials that we're using in a one-to-one -one, uh, ratio of water in Duraflor 56, for the last year and a half, the material's been soaking for, and we haven't seen a single um, uh, change in that since we placed it in there. So um, we're very confident with the reliability of the dissolvers, um, and uh, we will be continuing to pump out more good ones. Good stuff. Thanks, Evan. Um, another question we have here, again, regarding, uh, looks like DBNPA. It says, how can you confirm that DBNPA has been fed? Oh, I think there's a couple different ways. And I, I just go back to kind of the, the way I always kind of conducted service and, and how I went about with account management. You know, you look at inventory, you look at inventory change, you look at things like that. So, you know, our materials, our products sit inside of the uh, kind of the sleeve or housing, uh, whether it's bottle form or disc form, uh, it's translucent lid, it's, a, it's a, a design where you're able to, to easily look at inventory change. So that's one methodology that's to me tried and true, um, where you're able to, to look at rates of change over time. Uh, we have looked at some other uh, ways of, of looking at um, DDMPA. There is a test for, uh, test kit out there um, that can test for DDMPA. We've deployed it in some of our R&D applications and have gotten good confirmation of, of DDMPA at, at the levels and uh, we would expect in the system. Um, so there's a few different methodologies for looking at food verification on it. All right, thanks, Matt. Um, we have a few more here, but first there are some shout outs to Dave that just people want to say hi to you, Dave. FYI, you're pretty popular. All right. Hi, <laughs> Dave. All right, the next question we have here is um, Do you need to dissolve surfactants? Yes, yeah, so by, by design. So uh, our, our surfactant chemistry uh, is manufactured in, in our kind of a traditional uh, way. So it's uh, currently available in bottle form, so it can be uh, incorporated in a continuous feed methodology or slug dosing, whether you're using the Ultra M or the Ultra D dissolvers. So that's what you, know, you could utilize for putting it online. Uh, we do make uh, the C pen in a stick form currently. So uh, whenever you have a, a situation, let's say you're doing a remediation, or you're doing a tower, you know, start up or shut down and you want to get uh, surfactant in there to help kind of remediate, uh, eliminate biofilm. Uh, the stick form of our C pen is just a fantastic kind of adjunct product. Uh, so uh, high, you know, highly soluble and uh, it's, it's, you know, kind of a really good, uh, if I was back in the field, I'd, I'd want to have, you know, the product, you know, with me for, uh, you know, for, for application use, just such a strong chemistry. Fantastic. Okay. The next question we have is, will there be a future expansion of solid biocides for treating fungi or algae? That's uh, the million dollar question, right? And the reason it's the million dollar question is because of millions of dollars it takes. Biocide registration is, is challenging. I mean, if you look across the board to, you know, water treatment companies that are out there, Unless you're very basic in biocides, um, it's 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 challenging to get new biocides on the market, and with the time required to to do the about the the testing and and the toxicity and all the you know aquatic you know aspect, all that stuff that goes into it. So we still feel strongly that if you need algicide, 
you, you go, you, you deploy it. So there are some good uh, versions out there on the market, whether it's Jabutazine or, or other like molecules. Um, so certainly, um, you know, deploy those as needed. Uh, they can be a complement to uh, a solid buy side program uh, for sure. All right, thanks for that. Um, the next question I have is, what is your opinion of using ORP for stabilized bromine technologies? So stabilized bromine technologies, which would be, uh, you know, what we'd be deploying in the uh, durabrome chemistry. From a control standpoint, with anything, you know, that I've done in the field, I always like to, to deploy that with testing and, and verification first. Uh, not out of the gate, um, plug and play and move on. You want to look at ORP response based on your water conditions, temperature, pH, factors like that, that would impact uh, ORP and, and ORP response. You'd want to look at dosing and, and again, do total and free chlorine testing during the setup. Um, once you've got confirmation um, of what ORP response is and kind of what your resulting you know, halogen residuals are, then I would look at deploying ORP uh, as a way to um, to monitor, uh, certainly, um, and build with confidence built, then deploy it in a in a control mechanism or a control uh, methodology as well. So, uh, but I, I I take that kind of opinion across the board with any you know anything I'm doing with sensor technologies as well. You want to you want to validate, um, you want to look, you monitor, test, and then um, you know then implement. All right, and it looks like we have just one final question that came in, so I want to read that. It says, is Duraclor 56 affected by the current supply shortage on solid chlorine products? Our, our take on that right now is, is that it's primarily around the tableted form of the dichlor and trichlor uh, specific to that, that plant. Uh, that impacts more, more on the pool industry uh, we have a granular form of our dichlor, and at this point in time, um, we're not seeing any any impacts uh, on availability. Um, yeah. All right, that's the last question we have here. So I just want to say um, a quick thanks to Matt, Evan, and Dave for piping in on those questions, and thanks, Matt, for presenting today. Um, everyone that's on here, just be on the lookout for an email from us that will contain a link to this recorded webinar. You can go ahead and forward it on to your coworkers or watch it in your spare time for fun. Um, and please, you know, feel free to keep on reaching out with questions. Um, we'd love to answer anything that you might have. Um, also, just a reminder to follow us on LinkedIn for all of our latest updates. And um, in conclusion, I would just really like to thank all of you. Um, on behalf of the entire AP Tech team, thanks for joining us. Thanks for your support of AP Tech, Solid Chemistry, and we'll talk to you all soon. Have a good one.